Hello friends, I am Professor Dabiru Shridhar Patnaik, Director of the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies and Executive Director of Center for South Asian Legal Studies at the Jindal Global Law School of the OP Jindal Global University. Today, I will be taking this unit on uh, human security or human rights which is more basic on behalf of the content writer and Rajkumar, Associate Professor of Law, Savita University. Before we start, let us look at the learning outcomes of this unit which we wish to achieve at the end of uh, this particular unit. And the learning outcomes are as follows. Students will know the concept or idea of human rights and human security. The student will be able to acknowledge or understand the interlinking of security as a part of human rights. You should also be in a position to appreciate international conventions adapted for human security aiming to preserve human rights. Further, towards the end, you must be able to understand the debate on prioritizing human rights or human security, which one is important. With an aim to achieve these learning outcomes, let us now briefly understand what this unit is all about. To start, human security is a concept that has been in existence and has been a part of the society since time immemorial. The concept of human security is the one that arose from the insecurities of human being. Such insecurity is an ancient phenomenon. Various insecurities faced by humans in the form of threats of famine, war, drought, flood, plague, enslavement, etc. appear in numerous ancient writings across the world. Over the period of time, the nature of the threat may have changed. However, the threat per se has remained consistent. and thereby, as you may all know, making it extremely difficult to explain the term human security in few words. Academic definitions of the term human security range from narrow concepts focusing merely on physical integrity or a very limited number of threats to be addressed to an extremely broad understanding encompassing psychological and emotional aspects of security as well. The term international human rights, now when we come to discuss about this, when seen at its broadest sense is a regime that comprises not only customary laws and treaty law but also several other soft law instruments that are with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other major United Nations covenants and also conventions like Genocide Convention and several other regional human rights instruments. The United Nations Commission on Human Rights 
together with its special procedures and the jurisprudence of international courts established with the objective of promotion and protection of human rights. Thus, human rights encompass all civil, cultural, economic, political and social rights. And to tell you, most importantly, its application is not limited to only in certain areas. The term human rights or right at its core is the interest of a human protected by law. Human security, on the other hand, is a secure condition or a feeling. Therefore, it appears to be a broader concept as it comprises all the fundamental rights in addition to the basic capabilities and absolute needs. Further, human security comprises even those uh, threats that are not primarily covered under the conventional view of human rights, such as, most importantly, natural disasters, and further stretches towards threats from both the state and non-state actors, thus making human rights a part of the broader concept of human security. However, since the term human right too includes the concept of security, you all should know that there exists a debate on which of the two concepts hold water. And in that context, this unit concentrates on two primary points, with the first being the violation and the fear of violation of human right for an act performed with the intent of protecting human security. One of the best examples for the same is the threat to human life in an armed conflict, whether national or international internet. An act in most cases justified as a measure to neutralize a threat to human security. This act which results in the violation of human right is discussed in detail with special references to issues pertaining to the use of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, which is one of the biggest threat to the right to life. And right to life is the basic premise of a human right. Similarly, the issue pertaining to collateral damage during the course of an armed conflict is also considered for discussion here for your understanding as the same is again an action that results in the loss of human life. This paper shall also discuss whether the concept of human right in itself is encompassed with the concept of human security. Talking about armed conflicts, armed conflicts generally comprise those actions that involve measures that are adapted to safeguard human security and actions that are necessary for neutralizing any threat to the same. Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights expressly provides that every human being has the inherent right to life and that the right shall be protected by law and that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his or her life. Further, Article 6 of the ICCPR, thus, while creating positive obligations, requires states, parties to the covenant 
actively to protect the right to life or the life of the citizens and to avert any kind of threats to their life. However, before going further in this premise, it is important to identify on the issue of whether Article 6 applies to the situations of armed conflicts, a term that we had referred to so far. In 1996, the principal judicial arm of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, dealt with this very question in an advisory opinion and categorically held that in principle the right not to be arbitrarily deprived of one's life applies also in hostilities. But further went ahead to state that the test of what constitutes an arbitrary deprivation of life shall be determined by the law applicable in that particular armed conflict. And in any potential armed conflict, one of the major threat to human right is caused with the fear of use of weapons of mass destructions, including nuclear weapons which would inflict a violation of human right in the most severe form. Similarly, there are various other instances whereby there exists a violation of human right, including collateral damages, illegal detentions, etc. While referring to weapons of mass destruction, the WMDs also encompass chemical, biological and also nuclear weapons that we refer to. It is imperative to note that while chemical and biological weapons have the capacity to, to cause great and indiscriminate harm, however, their overall effect is negligible when they are compared with that of today's strategic nuclear weapons. And some of which have a destructive capacity to as much as 30 times or more than that of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Weapons of mass destruction, including atomic and nuclear weapons, have played a major role in the violation of right to life, as well as right to life in a peaceful environment. Right to life, therefore, is undoubtedly the most basic human rights, and its guarantees <coughs> can be found in almost every international convention that guarantees this human rights. The International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights under Article 6.1 states that, and for the context it is important to state it once again, that every human being has the inherent right to life and this right shall be protected by law and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. Similarly, it is important to recall the Charter of the United Nations over here. And while the Charter emphasizing on its commitment of maintenance of peace in its preamble categorically lays down that the United Nations is determined to save the coming generations from the scourge of war, the sufferings of war and its allied issues and thereby reaffirming the fact that it is the primary mission of the United Nations to maintain world peace. And thus, in an indirect way, guaranteeing people a right to peace. 
Another important development over here. In 1983, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution denouncing nuclear war as a violation of the foremost human right, the basic right, that's the right to life. Now, this prompted the United Nations Human Rights Commission to hold that nuclear weapons are among the greatest threats to the right to which or the right to life which confront mankind today. And it has been further stated that their production, testing, possession, deployment and use should be prohibited and recognized as crimes against humanity. The right to peace of an individual is well accepted as a human right. The use of weapons of mass destruction including nuclear weapons are often justified by various states as you may all know in possession of those weapons as well as those advocating its use or stalking by reiterating that it's, it's, a, it's a means of deterrence or a deterrent and hence it is referred to as a very important and integral means for the maintenance of human security. This along with the opinion of the ICJ or the International Court of Justice on the legality of nuclear weapons case has created a way to justify the use of nuclear weapons in a potential conflict. However, it is important for us to know that the major issue that has been overlooked herein is that even in case of presuming that the use of nuclear weapons against a target state is lawful as per the rules of engagement or the rules of armed conflict as laid down by the International Court of Justice, the use of nuclear weapons would surely have again a radioactive fallout as we had seen in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, which would directly affect third states beyond the target state or the target state's national boundaries. And this would act as a classic example of the fact that the use of nuclear weapons would surely violate the right to life of civilians living in such states that they are or that are beyond the target state's national boundaries. Thus, there exists a clear conflict between the principle laid down under Article 6 of the ICCPR and the use of threat of potential use of nuclear weapons, which has led to a debate on whether there is a need for nuclear disarmament in order to protect human rights. Over here, the major question which is posed and important for us to consider is that whether collateral damage can ever be or may be considered as violation of a human right. In technical parlance, collateral damage is a term used in international humanitarian law to euphemistically express the damage caused by military attack, offensive or defensive, to non-military civilians and civilian objects who are not part of that conflict. An example for collateral damage is the damage caused to civilians during an act of attack on an enemy target wherein either any civilian around such area gets killed 
or injured or any village or residential area around such target is damaged during such an attack such a case of an unintentional killing or causing of injury to a civilian or damage to a civilian property would be construed as quote and quote collateral damage the damage inflicted upon them happens collaterally with the military target that was originally intended to be attacked and that's the important point here and it is a well accepted principle under humanitarian law that no civilian target shall be attacked intentionally and any act thus inevitably resulting in collateral damage would be in violation of the basic premise or the tenets of humanitarian law and also the international human rights law with the violation of right to life and security of a person however in most armed conflicts a collateral damage of some sort or the other occurs either accidentally or negligently or at times even purposefully this has led to the idea of the threshold of acceptability of collateral damage whereby it is presumed that such collateral damage is within the standard set for or prescribed under international legal and humanitarian law however the term acceptable collateral damage is a subjective one and depends on the quantum of damage uh, that is inflicted upon civilians vis-a-vis -vis military locations that were the primary target of the attack thus uh, collateral or incidental damage occurs when attacks that are targeted at military objectives cause civilian casualties and damage to civilian objects in a number of instances in cases of military objectives such as military equipment or soldiers are located at cities or villages or close to civilians and generally an attack at such a location it inevitably causes collateral damage it is imperative to note that attacks that are expected to cause collateral damage are not prohibited per se however the laws of uh, armed conflicts restrict indiscriminate attack on civilian locations it's important to note the additional protocol 1 to the 1949 geneva conventions under article 571 state that in an international conflict constant care shall be taken to spare the civilian population civilians and civilian objects further under article 51 of the additional protocol categorically prohibits attacks that employ methods and means of combat wherein its effects cannot be controlled finally any attack whereby the collateral damage expected from such attack is not proportional or proportionate to the military advantage that is anticipated and is prohibited and thereby paving way for a need for determining whether the collateral damage to a conflict is within the acceptable or permissible limits of the law one of the most important concerns of human rights that we must all recognize 
has always been that security and well-being of the individual. Security of individual in itself is thus a human right. Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in a very clear manner refers to security as an integral part in the framework of human rights. Together with two other important components, the right to life and liberty. Article 3 of the UDHR, it thus comprises three different yet interlinked rights. That is the right to life, which is generally construed as the right to life in a biological sense, as well as in a wider sense, which includes even a right to a dignified life. <clears throat> the second part of the definition, which encompasses the right of personal freedom, a term which is quite expansive and thereby guarantees an array of rights and finally the right to personal security. The interpretation of the definition of the term human right under article 3 of the UDHR is generally in a numerous uh, instances and done by reading it along with article 5 of the UDHR which deals with the prevention of torture, another very important aspect. And article 9 of the UDHR which deals with the freedom from arbitrary arrest or detention. Thus, the right guaranteed under Article 3 of the UDHR is more or less seen as an obligation on the state not to interfere with the integrity of the individual. In order to understand the intent behind the right to security as guaranteed under the UDHR and so as to understand the importance of right to security as an integral part of human rights. It is important that one studies the drafting process or the drafting history of Article 3 of the UDHR, wherein a proposal by Cuba to insert the protection of integrity by adding it as a separate term was rejected with a justification that the term integrity was covered by the term security. Similarly, another interesting development from that history, an amendment proposed by Belgium to include a reference to respect for the physical and moral integrity of a person was also turned down with a similar response or a justification. Thus, the intention of the drafters of the UDHR is clear that they had a broader notion or connotation of the term security, which is encompassed in Article 3 of the Declaration. The intent of Article 3 of the UDHR to include right to security as an integral part of human rights has also subsequently been adopted in its spirit by various other international and even regional human rights instruments. And it is important to understand this. The same is evident from various conventions assuring human rights. The fact that the term security is encompassed in human rights conventions can be construed as an indicator while looking for and responding to questions of whether human security is a human right. We are now moving towards the conclusion of the unit and it can be said that the possession of nuclear weaponry and other weapons of mass 
destruction is inevitable perhaps and is something that cannot be done away with despite the fact that there is an inherent risk of its use which in all likelihood would cause large scale damage beyond the borders of a nation wherein it was originally intended to be used however as a matter of fact the reasoning that nuclear weapon and other wmds or weapons of mass destruction acts as a deterrent against those states and non state actors whom may use in an unjustified or reckless manner given the current state of affairs in some of the quote and quote banana republics and states that sponsor terrorism are in possession of weapons of mass destruction appears to be the prime factor prime factor to till the balance in favor of possession of nuclear weapons it's only one of the arguments not the argument especially as a means of deterrent therefore in this period where there are numerous conflicts and especially the one to combat terrorism even collateral damage at times looks inevitable it may be debated that non combatants if in case we consider the humanitarian law parlance have a right not to be exposed to harm even in a situation of a non conflict however in a fight for securing human security in a larger perspective it is almost next to impossible to enforce it and what can be seen finally is whether the collateral damage is within the permissible or acceptable limits of international legal framework the international humanitarian law however the sad part of it is that any investigation into whether a collateral damage is justified or not happens much after the real damage is done the efforts to identify as to whether human security or human right is more basic has helped the fact to come into light that human security is a concept that extends the debate on human rights into a completely different dimension and also along with it brings various other issues such as humanitarian intervention humanitarian assistance that happens on the grounds of alleged serious human rights violations or the use of force with the intention of protecting human rights and also the human rights violations by non state actors come into the debate over here in order to explore further especially on the use of force whereby there is a violation of human right so as to protect human rights it requires as many of you would agree and understand further more studies and analysis that alone can perhaps enable us to map the critical important question of whether and how human security can explain and delows for the use of force in order to protect human rights at the end of the day it is imperative that one understands that in order to ensure the maintenance of one's security the human right of another person shall not be violated by any way and also that the concept of human security in itself is one that is encompassed within the concept of human right thus 
one has to draw a fine line at a point wherein by staying within the confines of law <clears throat> all necessary steps to ensure human security are taken and nobody's human rights is being violated and in any unjust manner whatsoever in this process friends with this we come to the end of this unit thank you very much for your patience and engaged listening